praise the Lord. Thank you, Dad. Uh, just kind of a means of announcement, because I know we, I mentioned this earlier, and Ian kind of gave me the, 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 the notification that Facebook Live is still not working. If anybody is technologically advanced and knows how to fix it, by all means, I would appreciate it. I'm not. I know it says that it's live on there, but evidently it's not live for somebody to watch. So, if you can help me figure that out at some point in time, that would be great because there are those who do rely on the live feed uh, to be a part of service. Uh, turn your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Haggai, chapter 2. Please stand out of the reverence for the reading of God's Word. Haggai, chapter 2. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of the last books of the Old Testament. And I know I like to say this is one of my favorite verses in Scripture, but this really is one of my favorite verses in Scripture. One of my favorite Old Testament passages. Haggai, chapter 2, verse 9. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promises. I thank you that, Lord, we can believe by faith and stand upon the promises of God, knowing that your will did not change. And that, Lord Jesus, that we see the glory days before us. So guide this word. Lord, speak through me. May I merely share what you place upon my heart. And may I not get in the way of what you want to say. Teach us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. The title this morning, Rebuilding the Temple. Rebuilding the Temple. And in 586... B.C. Is anybody around back then? 586 B.C. Bill? You feel like it some days? Yeah. 586 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar breached the wall of Jerusalem. The Jews were taken captive by the Babylonians. The temple was pillaged and vandalized. And as the center of worship and life for the Jewish people, this crushed their identity. I want us to think about that. For the Jewish people, everything centered around the temple. The moment the temple was vandalized, the moment the temple was pillaged, they lost their identity. As a nation. What led up to the fall of Jerusalem? You think, how could God let his chosen people be pillaged, be robbed, be, be taken into captivity? What had to happen to bring that about? Number one, they forgot the divine leading of the Almighty. They forgot who their God was. They forgot who their Heavenly Father was. They forgot the one who gave them the promised land in the first place. They forgot their identity. The moment we forget God, what's the next step? We create a God. And so number two, widespread idolatry. Rather than worshiping the God of heaven, they began to worship 
handmade gods, golden gods. You know, I have to wonder why so many of the idols were gold. Think about this. Why do you think that idols were made of gold? Because gold was valuable. In reality, what they were worshiping was money. Think about that. They were worshiping possessions. They were worshiping physical things. They were worshiping things that were created. I always like to remind people, when we get to heaven, Scripture tells us that we will be walking on streets of gold. As valuable as gold is on this planet, in eternity in heaven with the Lord, gold is nothing more than a street. Anybody want to go out and get some of the street with all that oil and film and stuff on it? Cool. We'll consider that's all. That's the streets in heaven are just gold. Meaning there's far more value in heaven. Than gold. So they worship these idols that were brought in by other nations. They began to commingle with these other nations who were living idolatrous lives, and the and, and the, the Jews begin to adopt idolatry. When you start to worship idols, when you forget who God is, it's inevitable. You lose your moral compass. I want to tell you something. I, I, I hope you're starting to get the picture here. I'm not only talking about Israel or Judah. I'm also talking about America. Hello? When we forget one nation under God. When we begin to worship idols. Money. Possessions, people, power. We lose that moral compass. We don't know right from wrong. Even though it's instilled within us at creation that is part of who we are, we understand right from wrong. We blur the lines. And we lose that moral compass. And once we've blurred our moral compass... We become complacent with the enemy. We become complacent with the enemy. Israel had enemies. Judah had enemies. There were people who wanted to invade. But because they lost that, or they became complacent. They, weren't wor they were God's chosen people. Why should I worry about any enemies? If God is for us, who can be against us? Brothers and sisters, as we compromise morally, we become complacent with the enemy who is out to get God's people. And I've seen too many churches, too many lead Christian leaders fall because of complacency. We are slowly being given the green light to rebuild after being carried off into captivity to COVID-19. I feel like we've been in captivity for about a year and a half. <clears throat> it's time to start rebuilding. Rebuilding the temple. What lessons will we learn from our sojourn in captivity? Will we learn from these 18 months or however long it's been? Will we rebuild to bring glory to God? When we get the green light to rebuild, are we, going to, are we going to rebuild for the purpose of glorifying our Creator, our Savior, our God? And how passionate are we about rebuilding the house even more glorious than it was before captivity? That's the promise. You heard me read it. It says, 
The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Are we passionate about making that a reality? Brothers and sisters, the time has come to rebuild the temple. We have an inconsistent schedule of services, and our numbers have been fairly low. We've had an ins inconsistent schedule. I, I look at it, there, there were times during this whole pandemic that we canceled services on a last moment's notice. We had times where we were going to have a service, and we didn't have a service, and we did have a service. And I know it's got to be frustrating for you, it's frustrating for me. When the schedule's constantly changing, with every thing that's going on in the world around us, with those becoming vaccinated, the reopening of our nation, the church needs to begin rebuilding from the rubble. Hello? Yeah. <coughs> May we take to heart the Lord's promise to the Jews in the book of Haggai. May we receive that promise for us as well. And there are three things that I see in this passage, three things that jump out at me. And the first one is greater glory. Number one, greater glory. One of my favorite promises in Scripture is found in this text this morning. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. In other words, the best is yet to come. Amen. Hello? <clears throat> the best is yet to come. Looking back over a hundred, almost 125 years. No, I'm not that old. But looking back over the, the history of Bethany Church of Franklin, and many, some of you know it much better than I do. There have been many things that have happened. Glorious things that have happened over the last 125 years. I can tell you this about this church family. And those of you who are here, those of you who are fairly know you are, you should know it. Bethany Church of Franklin is a body of believers that loves people and welcomes all people. You may be a visitor one week, but you'll feel like family before you leave. And I've noticed that time and time again. Some faces may change, but the reality of the nature of this church family has not. We are still family. And we still, and it's changed through the course of years, it's changed through the course of pastors, it's changed through the course of many faces that have gone through the doors. It's still, it's still a church that loves people and welcomes all. Amen. There's been a history of strong children's ministry through vacation Bible school, church camps, and van ministry. Dad, you have told me that, that Grandpa, when he was pastoring here, would drive the van and pick up kids in the hills. What van? What van? Or whatever he drove. The Studebaker. The Studebaker that he drove. <laughs> and he would go around, and because there were kids in the hills that needed to know Jesus. And there are many people who grew up in this church when my grandfather would pick up kids every Sunday for service. How many kids can you fit in the Studebaker? Eight. <laughs> in this day and age, seatbelts tell us so many, but back then it was probably a lot. Several. Several. We've had a solid women's ministry through the years. Active in missionary support. The missionary ladies, missionary circle, had the... Um, Christmas Bazaar, and many different things that have gone on through the years. Those were glory, glorious days. A giving church that sacrifices for the sake of accomplishing the goals given by the Lord. I am amazed that this facility, the Fellowship Hall, was built in, what, basically a year's time, debt-free, it's a fine facility out there. Most churches would go into debt for something like that for several years, 10, 20 years. The Lord blessed and people sacrificed and it was built. 
debt free. We've seen so many things accomplished, missionaries, as we've increased our giving to missions through the years. Because we have compassion for what God is doing. We want to be a part of what the Lord's doing. And we have given. And so looking back at the last 125 years, I'm only scratching the surface of what I know. Many of you know things that I don't of the glory days of yesteryear. And yet in this passage of scripture that I read, your latter days will be more glorious than your former days. The glories that we've seen thus far are not even as glorious as it's going to be. Praise God. That's good news. That's good news. Because I see so many wonderful things that Bethany Church of Franklin has accomplished by the hand of the Lord. As wonderful as our past has been, we are at a crossroads as a church. Do we run our course and allow the captivity to be our downfall? Or do we roll up our sleeves and rebuild the temple? For the Israelites, when they were sent back to Jerusalem, and when the Jews were sent back to Jerusalem, it was for the sake to rebuild the temple. Because what did I say? It was their identity. It was their civic building. It was what drew them together. And brothers and sisters, we have been sent back. Will we rebuild the temple or will we let it lay in ruins? Hello? Yeah. Our faith Obedience and efforts will result in greater glory. Number two. I caught this. This is the first time I've ever caught this when I'm reading this. You know, it's amazing. When you read scripture, you can read it a hundred times and see something new every time. At the end of this verse, it says, not only will there be, a, the glory will be greater, I will grant peace. There will be greater peace. As we rebuild the temple. I want to remind you. What does peace mean? Some people think. Oh. Peace and tranquility. Means there's nothing. No conflict. No problem. No strife. No struggle. And if you're finding that kind of peace. You're in a heaven. Because that's not peace on this earth. I can tell you this. It's not the absence of trouble. Jesus said in this life. You will have trouble. It is the ability to remain confident in the middle of the storm. People are always looking for the absence of problems. But this side of eternity, that will never happen. Instead, we should seek the powerful peace of God in the midst of our trials, knowing that no matter what, the Lord has everything under control. Amen. He's got it worked out. He can handle this. Consider the church and the world before COVID. Number one, divisions. Is our world divided? <laughs> Has the body of Christ suffered divisions? We suffered divisions theologically. We've suffered divisions uh, politically. We've suffered divisions structurally. There have been so many divisions within the world and within the body of Christ. Not only has there been divisions, but there have been discontent. There's been discontent. A growing pessimism of all leadership. When was the last time the... <laughs> The nation was relatively universally behind the president. Hello? I can't remember. 1945. 1945. <laughs> it's been a long time. There's a discontent with leadership, a pessimism. 
thinking that they are bad even before they open their mouths. <laughs> trying to find fault rather than trying to find unity. And in the body of Christ, this happens just about as much. I am so grateful for Bethany Church. But let me tell you, there are many churches out there that the moment a pastor comes, they have a short leash. And the moment they say something that may be slightly controversial, they start to hang themselves, so to speak. Not literally, but so to speak. There becomes a growing discontent. You're not telling us what we want you to tell us. And some of those churches, they don't want a leader. They want somebody to make them feel good. Problem seekers, when it comes to discontent, we are problem seekers rather than solution seekers. We become discontent because we're trying to find the fault with everything that we can find fault with instead of trying to solve those problems that we see. The body of Christ needs more sol problem solvers than problem seekers. Amen? Amen. So before COVID, there was divisions, there was discontent, and there was, they were defeated. The body of Christ was defeated by a world increasingly hardened to the gospel. People in this world are very hardened and have been. And efforts at evangelism, we've thrown up our hands and said, why try? They don't want to hear it. And the reason we try is because the gospel message is still the greatest message in the world. Amen. The message of the love of Jesus Christ for all who call upon his name shall be saved. Amen. There is no greater message and we carry it with us. Amen. But we settle into defeat and we hold on to that powerful message. Defeated by a lack of understanding of God's power in our lives. We are too focused on how overwhelmed we are, how bad it is, how bad the situation in the world and under COVID and with society is, that we forget that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That we are more than conquerors through him. Yes. We've been given those promises. The latter temple will have greater peace than the former house. It's going to take three things. If you take your notes, you want to write these down. Number one, submission to the will of the bridegroom. A submission to the will of the bridegroom. Who is the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus is. That we are submitted to the will of the bridegroom. Number two, a return to our purpose. Not bigger, fancier buildings. Not accumulating more people under one roof. Not programming people to exhaustion. I want to remind you, this is where the church had been. Bigger, fancier, more people. More programs. We were trying to glory in the material. And what makes the latter temple more uh, peaceful than the former house is that we are, number three, more committed. More committed to the Word of God. To knowing His Word. To studying His Word. To memorizing His Word. To sharing His Word. That we are more committed. That we are more committed to the will of God. What does God want? Not what do I like. What does God want? Some of you may not like to hear this. God doesn't always want what I like. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced that? There are times I don't like the way God's doing things. 
but I need to submit to his will. The word of God, more committed to the word of God, more committed to the will of God, and more committed to the walk with God. That's prayer. That's abiding with him. That is continually, daily being in the presence of the Almighty. He has never left us. He will never forsake us. Sometimes we put some barrier between us and him. It's usually within our minds. We just say, I'm not going to listen to you today. I say, I'd never say that. Sometimes our actions say that. More committed to the walk with God. And there's a third thing. When it says, when I see these greater glory and greater peace, and it's not immediately outlined in word for word in this text, but you can see it underlying, and that is greater power. Hello? Amen. There will be greater power than the body of Christ within the, within the temple. I am unashamedly Pentecostal. For the early church was established on what day? The day of Pentecost. And I don't advertise it as, because this is a non-denominational church, I don't advertise it to uh, make you think I'm trying to push one denomination over another. But the day of Pentecost was very significant in the history of the church. What were people doing in preparation for the day of Pentecost? They were praying. They were seeking God's will. They were humbling themselves. They were believing for God's promise. When Jesus said, when I believe, I'm going to send you the comfort, which is the Holy Spirit. They believed it. Amen. They waited for it. And they weren't going to do anything until the Holy Spirit came upon them. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon those believers Amen. who were seeking God's how? Seeking God's anointing, seeking the presence of God, seeking the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fell, and they were empowered to be witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. They were given great power. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, a man who had a good, was very adept at sticking his foot in his mouth. And when he began to speak, people got saved. That's the power of God at work. That is the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. The anointed preaching the Apostle Peter. And a great number of people healed and saved by the word of God. The early days of Pentecostalism were marked. And when I talk about Pentecostalism, I'm not talking about the early church. I'm talking about in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. When Pentecostal churches really began to open up, there was great excitement, great miracles, great freshness as they were believing for the move of God. In each of these two instances, the Lord moved in mighty ways. Amen. I want to get back to that comment that I made earlier. Our latter days will be more glorious than our former days. What God did on the day of Pentecost, what the Lord did in the early, in, in the churches. And I, I believe every different denomination that has arisen, there was a time where there was excitement and joy and a move of the Spirit that soon dissipated when we forget who our God is. When we become complacent and we lose our focus and our purpose. Church, we've been shut down for a year and a half. Now, yes, we've had service. Yes, we've been online. But the temple's in shambles. It is time to rebuild. And when we rebuild, we need. We need to have the glory of God. Amen. We need to have the peace of God. And we need to have the power. It's hard to imagine greater power than the early church or the early days of Pentecost. And yet I believe that's what's to come. I believe that's what lies ahead. For decades now, the church has settled for religiosity and structure. 
over the power of God. Man's structures cannot stand in the presence of God's power. We need to walk by faith in God's promises and trust in the power of God to do what we cannot do. And we are living in those last days. In closing, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to make this declaration. We will rebuild. We will rebuild. And I'm not asking for any of these opinions on this president, because like I said, since 1945, or whenever it was, no president's had universal acceptance. But on 9-11, President Bush, after 9-11, President Bush stood up at ground zero and said, we will rebuild. We will rebuild. We're not going to let our enemy have victory over us. Amen. I'm not talking about the state. I'm not talking about the government. I'm not talking about the governor. I'm talking about the enemy of our souls who wants to destroy the temple. And if we let the temple remain in ruins, we've given the enemy a victory. We stand here firmly today, church, and say we will rebuild. Amen. The Jews returned to Jerusalem and they rebuilt. If you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you're reading about the rebuilding. The body of Christ is charged with rebuilding the churches. Cities and countries have been devastated by natural disasters, chose to rebuild. New Orleans was hit hard with Hurricane Katrina and have been rebuilding the city. It's going to take effort. Rebuilding is not something that we just, all right, it's done. It's going to take work to rebuild. Some people wallow in the crushing defeat of the enemy. We think, oh, why me? Why do I have to go through this? I don't want to work that hard. It's too much. Others choose to roll up their sleeves and get to work. Which are you? Which are you? Are you going to complain, why me? Are you going to say, regardless of why this happened, it's time to start building. You may be rebuilding the temple for your benefit. And you might be rebuilding it for the benefit of future generations. But it's still a job that needs to be done. Amen. Your effort is vital. And the future of the church depends on all of us. The future of the temple depends on all of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I really believe that God is calling his churches. And I know this is a message for Bethany Church, but it's a message that's for the body of Christ throughout our land. That we have been shut down. We've been shut down by a pandemic. We've been shut down for a very long time. And it's time to rise up and rebuild again. And the Lord's going to strengthen us. The Lord's going to equip us. And I believe in the promise that the latter days will be more glorious, more peaceful, and more powerful than the former days. Praise the, praise the Lord. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promises to your church. I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that we would not dismiss this message. For Lord, we have a beautiful facility in the flesh. But Lord, through this year and a half, there have been many things that have come against the body of Christ. And Lord, we believe in your promise that the latter days will be more glorious than the former. And because we believe that, that Lord, that we are willing to be obedient to do what you would have us to do. To make that dream a reality. Guide us. Direct us. Equip us. 
And Lord, may we bear much fruit for your kingdom. Not for our name, but for the name of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that you'd lead your church. That you'd awaken us with the opportunities that lie before us. And that we'd be fully surrendered to what you have in store. Guide and direct us as we go today. Encouraged by your word and challenged as well. For Lord, we know that it's not going to be an easy task. But Lord, that you will walk alongside us every step of the way. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless.